Thank you, CFTE. I am David, I'm Managing Director of Avoidance Data Innovation. Some of the areas that I wanted to talk about have been absolutely fascinating. The first one is in language modeling. Think about this. For your Star Trekkies out there, Universal Translator, we are at a stage, we're at a point in time where someone could be speaking to you in a language which however much we'd love to learn, we don't quite fully understand or know at this point in time. Yet, you have, be it through the phone or through an in-air device, the ability of understanding what they're saying to you. It is absolutely unmanageable. If you would have gone back in time and told people that this could be done, the Tower of Babel, well, you've probably gone a whole bunch of biblical references. It is absolutely amazing. And one which personally really excites me because however much I try and learn new languages, I always find some difficulties there. It really not only gives us the possibility to communicate better, but to understand language in its intricity and complexity and retaining languages for their beauty. Satellite and drone data. We all like getting packages and deliveries and organizations and companies from the DHL, your AWS and many, many others all starting to see how to leverage on drones to deliver. But it's not just about deliveries. All of this naturally using satellite information, IoT information to be able to get from point A to point B in a manner that's safe, secure and fast. But it is also about how to do things and how to access, be it is from uh, building inspections, we need to go to extremely high rise, going underground to subterranean or in slightly more difficult or dangerous situations such as fires. All of this is the combination of IoT information, satellite information, drones, to make sure that we're extending ourselves to further or new possibilities. Explainable AI, literally opening the box. How do we make sure that everything that we do, every, and I truly mean everything, is done so in a manner that's accountable, there's governance, and most importantly, there's trust. This is what explainable AI means. Exactly at what stage and how it's explainable, that is what we're still teasing out. This is what we're still trying to understand. But essentially, it is about how to make sure that we have confidence, that we have comfort in what is being done, that is done in a manner that is uh, safe, secure, and helping us in making and impacting decisions. Then, of course, looking one step beyond is edge AI. Now, this one is kind of fun. Is how do we go from a world that has been initially very kind of dedicated in terms of the centralization, having those massive farms in terms of computing power. In fact, one would argue that one of the uh, possibilities that has made AI possible, moving it out from a lab, have been those giant supercomputers, cloud computing, and so forth. Now, edge takes us one step further. And how do we essentially take this processing computing, the, the intelligence in the algorithms, and actually bring it closer and closer and closer to the physical assets. This is still in infancy, but it really opens up some interesting and new possibilities in both how to make sure that the device in itself is intelligence, from um, autonomous uh, cleaning and vacuums to your refrigerator, to knowing exactly how many groceries and when do you need to order milk, to things that we can't even begin to imagine. Two, being able to make sure that that ability, those services, that specificity, the hyper-personalization, the safety, and all the other application in which AIs are being applied into are done in a continuous manner, leveraging on everything that's around us on the edge. Metaverse, how can I not talk about this? This is the area where more and more organizations are looking into. We have games which have already kind of started that metaverse experience. We're having now experiences, heck, banks could now be existing in the metaverse. So similarly, how do we make sure that metaverse, which is effectively a giant form of data, a representation of us, a representation of the environment we're in, the engagement that we're having is used in ways with explainability, with trust, in providing us further uh, comfort, ability, assistance, service, experience. This one is truly, the, it's only the beginning of the possibilities. But as we go into the metaverse, we also go into the world of the AI in the metaverse. With that, thank you, CFD. Back to you. My name is Jean-Philippe Debiol. I am Managing Director for Financial Services and I work for IBM. 
I want to thank uh, CFT for this opportunity to discuss with you about AI, artificial intelligence, applied to financial services industry. The first thing that I would like to share with you is about AI is definitely a hype topic, is a very hot topic, but at the end of the day, when we see the reality of the deployment, we can see that 31% of the company have actively deployed AI, but 43% are currently exploring intensively AI in order to make it real in the next month. The good news is we are facing in front of us a big wave of adoption of AI within our industry. Second point that I can mention to you is about size. Size of our customers, size matters. Today, unfortunately, AI is more a topic for big firms rather than the small ones. I think things will change, but again, step by step, we are facing now a big wave of deployment of AI, but we have still a big way to, to do right now. The second thing that I would like to share with you is about preconceived ideas, which are some of them barriers to this adoption. Point number one, we continue to have a big focus on data, which is critical, but we should have a focus on learning. How to improve the learning process of AI should be on top of our priorities. The second thing that I want to highlight is we talk a lot about algorithms, mathematics, models, but we should talk about cognitive science because AI is all about cognitive science. The third point that I would like to mention to you is about the fact that, yes, AI is a technology topic, but it's more than never a human topic, and we need to put human at the center of everything we do and we are working about. The second thing that I would like to mention to you is what does that mean to be able to, to put AI at scale, to deploy AI within the enterprise? It means three things, three pillars. The first one is about how to design, get, and deploy the appropriate operating model. We should think about new models. We cannot do things as business as usual. It's over. So think about what is the appropriate model in order to make sure we can deploy AI at scale, combining innovation, asset, industrialization, tooling, methodology, and HR to be sure that all these components are pulled together in order to be able to, again, not only deploy AI, to accelerate this transformation, but to do it at scale efficiently. The second pillar that we need is absolutely to get the appropriate AI and data foundation. To make a long story short, AI cannot be just another layer, which is becoming, by the way, quite complex, in addition to what we have done in the last 20 years, 30 years, on the analytic world. We have now to design a platform which is combining unstructured and structured data, which is combining the tools, the methodology, the skills, in order to take advantage of this revolution, which is around structured and structured, cognitive sciences, algorithms, models, with the appropriate technological platform, tooling, skills, impact on the business processes, in order, again, to make it real. Last but not least, it's all about trust. We cannot deploy AI at scale if we are not able to demonstrate that what we are doing is trusted. Trust, again, is about three things, simple, transparency, robustness, and explicability. But you know what? It's not only about trust. It's about the, to get the appropriate balance between hard and soft skills. And that's why I'm so happy to work with CFTE, which shares the same focus, the same conviction that education is key, but not in education only on one or the other component, an education which is bringing together the set of art skills, because we need to understand what is happening. We need to be hands-on, but also in the same time, the appropriate set of soft skills, which is necessary, which are necessary in order to take advantage of this revolution, which is about AI. Now, let's say, let's share a little, little bit what is happening right now in 2022 and what could be, at least in my perspective, uh, the hot topics. I think that we will have to continue to work more than ever about how to build and to envisage the new collaboration between human and machine. And when you think about this collaboration between human and machine, you have to think about are you able, yes or not, to objectivize the appropriate usage of AI, the appropriate usage of human, and the appropriate usage 
of the combination between AI and human. And potentially sometimes you should leverage one of them. Maybe you sometimes you have to leverage both of them, but you need to get facts. You need to be able to objectivize this uh, utilization of this revolution, which is uh, AI. And this piece of work now is in front of us, and you need to do it not only to make sure that you are investing your money in the appropriate initiatives, you need to be sure that you are investing in the appropriate topic in order to make sure that you are taking the appropriate decisions about why, when, and how to leverage this collaboration between human and machine. And last but not least, you need to be able to do it because you need to be ready for audit and regulatory compliance controls in order to make sure that what you do is trusted, is enabled by humans, and is compliant. I want to say thank you for this opportunity to talk to you today. It was a big challenge. Hello, everyone. My name is Diane Nolan. I'm a Managing Director of Financial Services from Accenture. Um, and today I'm, to, I'm going to talk to you about five key themes uh, which are um, related to uh, the usage of AI and its adoption. My first theme is around data quality and the fact that it's not an excuse for low returns. Um, uh, what's behind that is the fact that today I'm doing a lot of engagements with clients who are focusing on um, uh, data uh, analytics and AI, and they have made uh, extraordinary progress and specifically also accelerated with COVID. Nonetheless, they're not getting the right results out of data. Why is that? It's because essentially the, the key foundations um, which are data governance, data culture, um, proper discovery mechanisms, um, and a, a clear data strategy and operating model in some cases are, are not at all in place. Um, and essentially, if you don't get this right, you will find yourself uh, not getting the kind of quality results and therefore the uh, accurate uh, return on investment required. My second theme is around um, creating a data flywheel for a company. What is your data flywheel? What does that mean? Today, um, a lot of companies are looking at um, and investing in AI in specific areas, a lot around um, KYC compliance, sanctions, uh, um, a lot of processing, back office, as well as um, front office, more sophisticated um, investments. But they are uh, very much, um, you know, actionable insights and um, outcome driven for that specific an area. The model that we see more and more and we would like organizations to move towards is what we call a flywheel for your company, where essentially the um, investments that you're making uh, are, are feeding themselves or being self-fed by um, customer insights, um, by you know, and, and through through the usage and the, the services that you're offering, that these are, you know, self-fulfilling, self-enriching and creating essentially better outcomes, both for the customer, for uh, the organization, um, and obviously ultimately um, better performing um, and, and self-learning and uh, better outcomes uh, for, for everyone. An, exa an example of this is in um, operations where you have to mix a combination of process intelligence, behavioral data and contextual data in order to actually get the right um, transformational outcomes that you need. Um, and this, this means, you know, examples are in case management, workflow, operations processes. Um, again, uh, something concrete they've been working on recently. Um, another key theme around modern platforms and engineering. So cloud is, uh, is massive and we've all experienced and, and seen that it's a huge enabler for uh, AI as well. Um, it enables and provides capacity um, to uh, explore um, and uh, leverage data more effectively. Um, that said, um, you know, there's not enough speed and efficiency around deployment of cloud and AI is actually being used for that. So you can use um, uh, AI uh, to better assess the usage and capacity needs uh, for cloud. Um, but you also have, uh, and, and some of the challenges that we see around uh, getting there, we believe is a kind of a movement uh, for um, modern platforms and engineering, um, uh, AI ops, uh, DevSecOps, et cetera, leveraging AI and leveraging the, the, the learning around that. Another topic is sustainable alpha. So um, what does that mean? Um, today, a lot of organizations are creating their own uh, data sets, which is a, a, a you know a specific differentiator value add specifically in these times, COP26 is going on at the moment. Um, and there's huge investments in this space, but um, 
you know, the question we have uh, or asking ourselves is, uh, um, you know, is this sustainable? Um, the actual action of, you know, collating and creating um, own ESG data. We see a lot of um, uh, pressure on in terms of speed to get uh, new uh, types of data um, and use a and AI is being used, sorry, to uh, actually get there. Um, an example of that is we're seeing more and more uh, types of uh, analysis like contextual um, uh, contextual AI uh, to read um, reports. We see uh, more va va video analytics um, com being combined with all of these other data sources to create um, new uh, ESG uh, sources at speed. But the question is also, can, uh, you know, is this sustainable in itself um, as, a, as an activity, is uh, that the complexity um, grows? And uh, the reality is, is there's, there's certainly a market for ESG utilities. Um, you know, I think some of the, uh, the, uh, the financial infrastructures out there um, have a great opportunity to offer um, ESG um, data um, at scale for, for those who don't want to make those kind of investments. And then the last uh, topic is around uh, quantum. Uh, quantum is, um, we believe, a reality today. Um, it's both an unpredictable threat as well as a, an unimaginable opportunity. Why unimaginable? Because it's, uh, well, first of all, it's very hard to predict the real uh, or why as it's uh, not yet known. We're still in exploration phase, but, um, you know, we're, we see concrete uh, cases using, I'd say, more rudimentary uh, quantum or analog or quantum computing techniques, uh, for example, around uh, credit risk or others, um, which is happening already. Um, at the same time, and this is the unpredictable threat, is this, you know, um, there's uh, hackers out there and others who are um, very much using um, quantum to uh, to um, uh, hack and try to understand uh, uh, and you know crack the cryptographic uh, key um, uh, challenge. So um, you know if uh, quantum accelerates, it could also pose a, a significant uh, opportunity in terms of cybersecurity for our organisation. So what's key is to start the journey now. We believe and we know there's uh, data out there showing um, a, a potential move from 260 million investment in quantum um, today to 9.1 billion by 2030. So you need to learn um, you need to decide where and how to apply it in your business and uh, create, you know, already awareness around the uh, technologies needed and the talents needed to uh, to explore this in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Hello, I am Winnie Chang, Senior Lecturer at CFTE covering AI and finance. This has been a very interesting year for fintech as we move into improving conditions from the pandemic. It became a testing ground for whether certain financial technologies were just a temporary necessity of the pandemic or they're here to stay. The pandemic has introduced us to social distancing and reduction of contacts to prevent the transmission of diseases. Being able to pay without physically swiping the card or handing it to another person was as critical as wearing face masks or using hand sanitizers. But it wasn't just improved hygiene that we discovered. Contactless payments, not only is it cleaner, it is also a lot faster and much more convenient, a gentle tap and done. A survey conducted by Visa showed that nearly half, 48% of consumers said that they would no longer shop at a store that did not offer payment methods um, that are contactless. Many of us picked up new hobbies during the pandemic as we sheltered in place and suddenly found that we have a lot more time on our hands. This was a perfect storm for the rise of retail investing with easy access to trading apps like Robinhood and availability of information through traditional news media like CNBC and new social media channels like Reddit. Retail investing was a social experience in a socially distant time during the pandemic. While it's yet to be seen whether the growth of retail investing will continue, early this year we saw just how powerful this movement can be. The median retail investors only have 240 US dollars in their accounts, but when they all came together, they were able to send GameStop's price skyrocketing by 2,700% and brought on heavy losses at hedge funds that took the other side of the trade. Cryptocurrency goes mainstream in 2021. While Bitcoin prices are still going through wild spring this year, 
banks and central banks are taking cryptocurrencies seriously. On October 19th, the first Bitcoin-linked ETF made its debut for trading on the New York Stock Exchange. Banks like JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley have begun offering their wealth management clients access to crypto funds. Central banks worldwide are actively exploring the issuance of digital currencies. It has also become easier for users to hold digital currencies. In the US, PayPal started allowing users to buy, sell, and hold cryptocurrencies. Tesla, at one point earlier in the year, experimented with using Bitcoin as an acceptable payment. While this program is temporarily paused, there are expectations that it may return in the future. Cryptocurrency is now a serious digital asset class. Before the pandemic, bank customers were already getting comfortable with digital experiences, such as using a mobile phone to deposit checks. With the rise of investing platforms and crypto wallets, customers expect to control their money wherever they please. Digital-only banks or neobanks further show their strength. Customers can open accounts and cash their stimulus check swiftly from home. The number of monthly active users of neobank apps doubled between July 2019 and Ju June 2021, while those of traditional banking apps shrank a little. On August 13, Chime, US biggest neobank, raised a round of funding that valued at 25 billion, about the same as America's 13th largest listed bank. Neobanks offer convenience and much better user experience through digital channels. These are expectations and no longer nice to have. A survey found that bank customers perform over 70% of their transactions online. Digital banking is the new normal. Having seen what is possible, customers are demanding new ways of interacting with their bank. They don't want to think about banking. It is something that happens seamlessly as they go about their day, picking up groceries at Walmart, shopping for new furniture at Ikea, or buying a new electric car with Bitcoin. We live in a time where people may not be aware of who is providing the financial service, nor do they particularly care about what's happening behind the scenes. In this new world, we'll have accounts spread across various financial and even non-financial companies, because the likelihood that one will optimally solve all our banking needs is unlikely. Banks and fintechs will be part of a larger ecosystem with greater focus on downstream products and services that permeate many aspects of our day-to-day -day lives. Bank and fintechs may seem invisible, but they are also going to be everywhere, just in a different form. Thank you. And now back to CFTE. Hello all, I'm John Ng, a senior lecturer for AI in finance at CFTE. It's my pleasure today to share on what's happening with AI in finance and fintech and what the future holds. Lo and behold, a financial services act where AI is the key message. If that's not the tipping point, then I'm not sure what is. So this is an ad by a leading online lender in Hong Kong where AI is front, right and center, where it is essentially the selling point of the product itself. And if you look at the past uh, 18 to 24 months, it is clear that AI is everywhere from personalization, conversational AI, making investment decisions, detecting fraud, evaluating risks, automating processes, and many more. So AI is indeed everywhere uh, when it comes to financial services. We have also seen the proliferation of digital banks or virtual banks in the region. And the biggest impact has really been the time it takes to open an account. With AI, completing KYC really does take less time than it takes to make a cup of coffee. And AI in this case uh, primarily relies on computer vision uh, to check if you are a genuine and real person. And also at the same time, checking if it is indeed a genuine ID of yours. Another area uh, I'm watching with interest is uh, the use of uh, human-like avatars to interact with customers uh, in banking, for example. While some requires more work, uh, the one here is from Korea, and it really does feel quite natural. And for this, uh, AI is leveraged in a number of ways, 
First, it is used to understand your questions or responses while picking out visual cues on your emotions. And next, it then determines how it should respond, or whether it requires more information or if it is ready to provide an advice or recommendation. And finally, all of this comes together through the avatar where it responds back just like a normal human. And of course, um, there are many more applications of uh, AI in financial services. But no matter the application, uh, the biggest challenge right now really is how to make it explainable and ensuring trust. As we all know, banking is uh, in the business of trust. And as AI continues to be adopted at scale, it becomes crucial that the AI can be explained and it is transparent to maintain that trust between the bank and the customer. And increasingly, that is a uh, top of the mind for many financial institutions and the key objective uh, for ap AI applications going forward. So what does uh, the future really look like? And I think it will be all about uh, the fin metaverse, not the company, uh, but metaverses, uh, the virtual worlds that all of us will be part of. And just like anywhere we are in, uh, financial services will be required. And AI will have a key and important role to play here. From identity, uh, the virtual representation of you, uh, using AI to ensure that it is truly you and that it's an authentic you to interoperability, ensuring that the financial services you need is available and embedded into the different metaverses that you are part of, and to creating new interactions uh, with money, digital assets, or services. Yeah, so I hope this uh, short sharing uh, would inspire you uh, to continue to be with us and CFTE in this journey of learning to build the future of financial services with AI. Thank you.